The cultural or institutional rule is no polymaths allowed. You know, wow. you can you can be you can be narrowly specialized. Yeah. Um, and if you're interested in other things, you better keep it to yourself and not tell people. Because if you say that you're, you're interested in computer science and also music or studying the Hebrew Bible, um, wow, that's uh, that, that must mean you're just not very serious about computer science. Uh, I moved out to work with you in 2013, mm -hmm. and I'd never seen a boom before. I mean, this was mm -hmm. one of the things that mm -hmm. was really important to me is that being in academics, mm -hmm. um, the academy had been in a depression since this uh, change around 1972, 73. And seeing a boom mm -hmm. and seeing people with like flowers and dollar signs in their eyes, you know, talking about a world of abundance and how everything was going to be great. It seemed like everybody was the CEO or CTO of some mm -hmm. tiny company. Um, and then very, very quickly, it, it all started to change. And I felt like a lot of people moved back into the behemoths uh, from their little startup uh, mm -hmm. having failed. A lot of the ideology felt poisonous, like don't be evil was not even something you could utter uh, without somebody snickering behind your back. There's like a self-hating component where the engineers have been recruited mm -hmm. ideologically and are like not actually sure. there to do business. How did this happen so quickly? Well, it's always, it's... Am I wrong about that? Um, no, it's, it's striking how fast it's happened. It's striking how much it's happened in the context of a bull market. So if you describe this in terms of psychology, uh, you'd think that um, people would people be as angry in Silicon Valley as they are today. Um, you know, the stock market must be down 40 or 50%. It's like, you know, people in New York City were angry in 2009. They were angry at the banks. They hated themselves. But, you know, the stock market was down 50, 60 percent. The banks had gotten obliterated. And that, that, that sort of makes sense psychologically. And, uh, and the, uh, the strange thing is that on a, on, in terms of the, sort of the macroeconomic indicators, the stock markets, the valuations of the larger companies, it, it's, it's like way beyond the dot-com peaks of, of 2000 in all, in all sorts of ways. But the mood is not like late 99, early 2000. Um, it, it, it has this very different mood. And, and the way I would, would explain this is that uh, for the people involved, it is sort of a look ahead function. So it is, you know, um, yes, this is where, where things are, but are they going to be worth a lot more in five years, 10 years? And that's gotten, that's gotten a lot harder to, to tell. Um, and so there's been growth, but people are, are unhappy and frustrated because they don't see that much growth going forward, even within tech, even within this world of, of bits which had been, you know, very, very decoupled for, for such a long time. Now, one of the things that's interesting to me is, is that when we talk like this, a lot of people are going to say, wow, that's a lot of gloom and doom. Mm -hmm. So much is changing. So much is, is, is better. Um, and yet what I sense is, is that both you and I have an idea that we've lived our entire life in some sort of intellectual Truman show where everything is kind of fake. And something super exciting mm -hmm. is about to happen. Do you share, am I, is that a fair telling that? Well, I think that, uh, I think there's been the potential to get back to the future for a long time. And, you know, there, there have been breaks in this Truman show at various points. There was a big break with 9-11. There was a big break with the 2008 Lehman crash. Brothers. Um, you know, you could say there's some sort of break with uh, Trump. Brexit and Trump. And in yep. the last few years, it's still like a little bit undecided with what that all means. Um, but I, I think I think there were a lot of reasons to to question this and, and reassess this for some time. The, the reassessments never quite happened. Uh, but but I would say I think we're now at the point where where this is is really going to happen in the next, you know, um, you know, two years to five years to. To decade, I, I don't think the Truman Show can keep going, keep going that much longer. Well, you know, when I was, you know, and again, I, I was, I've been wrong about this. So just, me too. No, no, know, no I've, been, I've, been, I've been very I've been wrong. wrong. I've called it. You know, we had, we had an offsite when I was running PayPal in spring of two thousand one. You know, the Nasdaq had gone from two thousand to five thousand, back to two thousand. Um, dot com bubble was over, and I was explaining, you know, we're just battening down the hatches. At least our one little company has survived, and we're going to survive. And uh, but the sort of insanity that we saw the dot-com years will never come back in the lifetimes of the people here. 
because, you know, it's psychologically, you can't go that crazy again while you're still alive. Right. You know, the ni- 1920s didn't come back till the less maybe the, the 1980s or something. We're long lived. Generationally, yeah, yeah, yeah. Was, was over. And yet, already in 2001, we had the incipient housing bubble. And, uh, and somehow, somehow the show has kept going for, uh, for, for 20 years. Well, with a crazy years. narrative, like the whole narrative behind the great moderation. I mean, I remember just like clutching my head. How can you tell a story that we've banished volatility? Yes, it's always, I, I always think of um, the 1990s narrative was the new economy and you lied about growth. And then the uh, 2000s narrative was um, uh, the great moderation and you lied about volatility. And, uh, and maybe, you know, there's sort of a, the, the, the 2010s one is a secular stagnation where you lie about the, the real interest rates because the other two don't work anymore. And, and, and sort of a complicated way these things connect. But, uh, but yes, um, new economy sounded very bullish in the 90s. Great moderation um, was still a reason to be long stocks, but um, sounds less bullish. And then secular stagnation in the Larry Summers form, just to be specific what we're talking about, uh, means, um, again, that you should be long the stock market. The stock market's going to keep going up because um, things are so stagnant, the real rates will stay low forever. So, um, so they are equally bullish narratives, although they sound less bullish over time. So that effectively we need what happened with the roaring twenties followed by the depression Mm -hmm. was that there was a general skepticism and here the skepticism seems to be specific to something different in each incarnation that you, you keep having bubbles with some lie you have yet to tell. Yes. But I think, (laughs) and of course I think the, the crazy cut on the, 20s and 30s was that we didn't need to have as big of a crash. You could you could have probably done all sorts of intervention because the 1930s was still a period that was very healthy in terms of background scientific technological innovation. If we just right. rattle off what was discovered in the 1930s that had real world practical things, it was um, the aviation industry got off the ground, the uh, talkies and the movies got uh, um, um, got going. You had um, you had the plastics industry. You had the uh, um, you know, you had secondary oil recovery, you had household appliances got developed. Uh, and, um, and, you know, by 1939, there were three times as many people who had cars in the U S as in 1929. And so, uh, it was, there was this crazy, uh, tailwind of scientific and technological progress that then somehow got, you know, badly mismanaged financially by whoever you blame the crash on. Uh, and so I think that's, that's what actually happened in the thirties. And then, um, and then we try to sort of manage all these financial indicators much more precisely in recent decades, um, even though the tailwind wasn't there at all. So l- let me focus you on two subjects that um, are important for trying to figure out the economy going forward. I'm very fond of perhaps overclaiming, um, but making a strong claim for physics that physics gave us uh, atomic devices and nuclear power and ended World War II defi- definitively. It gave us uh, the semiconductor, the World Wide Web, theoretical physicists invented molecular biology, uh, the communications revolution. All of these things came out of physics. And uh, you could make the argument that physics has been really underrated as powering the world economy. On the other hand, it's very strange to me that we had the three-dimensional structure of DNA in 53. We had the genetic code 10 years later. And we've had very little in the way of, let's say, gene therapy uh, to show for all of our newfound knowledge. Now, I have no doubt that we are learning all sorts of new things, to your point about specialization in biology. But the translation hasn't been anything like what I would have imagined uh, for physics. So it feels like somehow we're in a new orchard and we're spending a lot of time exploring it, but we haven't found the low hanging fruit in biology. Mm -hmm. And we've kind of exhausted the physics orchard because what we found is so exotic that, you know, Mm -hmm. whether it's two black holes colliding or, you know, a third generation Mm -hmm. of matter or or quark substructure, we haven't been able to Mm -hmm. use these things. Are we somehow between revolutions? Well, I think I, I would say the question of what's going on in bi- I'm, I wouldn't bet, I wouldn't, I'd be pessimistic on physics generally. So that's me, sort of be well. my bias on that one. Um, biology, I, 
continue to think we could be doing a lot more. We could be making a lot more progress. And, uh, you know, the pessimistic version is that, you know, biology is just somehow is much harder than physics. And therefore, um, therefore, it's been slower going. The, uh, the more optimistic one is that, you know, the, the culture is just broken. We have, we've had very talented people go into physics. You go into biology if you're, if you're less talented. You know, it's sort of like uh, you can sort of think of it in Darwinian terms. You, you can think of biology as a selection for people with bad math genes. You know, if, you, if, you're, if you're good at math, you go into physics, you go to math or physics or at least chemistry. Um, and, uh, and, and biology, we sort of selected for, um, you know, all of these people who were, um, somewhat, somewhat less talented. So that might be, that might be a cultural explanation for, uh, for why it's been, been slower progress. But I mean, we, we had people from physics, we had like Teller and Feynman and Crick. There's no shortage of, I mean, you know, to, to my earlier point, molecular biology anyway, was really founded by physicists. Um, more than it, more than any other thing, I think. Um, why is it that in an era where physics is stagnating, we don't see these kind of minds? Like, I'm a little well, skeptical of that of that theory. Well, I, I, I I'm not, <coughs> I'm not so sure. Like, if you, you know, if you're a string theory person or even sort of an applied experimental physicist, yeah. uh, I don't think you can that easily reboot into biology. I mean, these, these you know these disciplines have gotten sort of more um, more rigid. Um, it's 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 pretty hard to to transfer from one area to another. I had I, you know I when when I was an undergraduate, you still had some you know older professors who were polymaths who knew a lot about a lot of different things. Right. This is this is I think the way one should really think of you know Watson and Crick or Feynman or you know or Teller. They they you know they they were certainly world class in 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 their field, but also. Like incredible in, in a they lot were of highly fields. transgressive and um and and you know the, the the cultural or institutional rule is no polymaths allowed. You know, wow. you can you can be you can be narrowly specialized. Yeah. Um, and if you're interested in other things, you better keep it to yourself and not tell people because if you say that you're you know, you're interested in computer science and also music or studying the Hebrew Bible, um, wow, that's uh that's that's just uh. That, that must mean you're just not very serious about computer science. Well, so I, I totally want to riff on, on this point because I think you've hit the nail on the head. To my way of thinking, the key problem is if you go back to our original mm -hmm. uh, contention, which is, is that there is something universally pathological about the stories mm -hmm. that every institution predicated on growth has to tell about itself um, when things are not growing. The biggest danger is that somebody smart inside of the institution will start questioning things and speaking openly. And it seems like the polymaths would be the people who could connect the dots and, and say, you know, there's not that much going on in my department. There's not much going on in this department over here, not that much going on in this department over there. And those people are very, very dangerous. You know, one of my, uh, one of my friends uh, uh, studied uh, physics at Stanford in the late nineties. Um, his advisor was uh, this professor at Stanford, Bob Laughlin, who, um, sure. you know, the late '90s, um, was a brilliant physics guy. Late '90s, he gets a Nobel Prize in physics, and he suffers from the the supreme delusion that now that he has a Nobel Prize, he has total academic freedom and he can do anything he wants to. And he decided to direct it at, um, you know, I mean, there are all these areas you should, probably shouldn't go into. You should, probably shouldn't question climate science. You should, there are all these things one one should be careful about. But he went into an area far more dangerous than all of those. He was convinced that there were all these uh, people in the, in the university who um, were doing fake science, who were wasting government money on fake research that was was not really going anywhere. And he started by you know, investigating other departments. He started with the biology department at Stanford University, and you can imagine this ended catastrophically for Professor Laughlin. You know, his uh, graduate students couldn't get PhDs. He no longer got funding, Nobel uh, Peace Prize. A sort of Nobel Prize in Physics, no protection whatsoever. Yeah, Julian Schwinger um, fell out of favor with the physics community despite being held in its highest regard and having a Nobel Prize. And he used the epigram in a book where he wanted to redo quantum field theory around something he called source theory. He said, if you can't join them, beat them. And I think it comes as a shock to all of these people that there is no level you can rise to in the field that allows you to question the assumptions of that field. Right. It's, it's like, you know, you're sort of proving yourself, you're, you know, you're getting your PhD, you're getting your tenured position, 
and 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 then at some point you think you would think that you've proven yourself and you can you can uh, talk about the whole and not just the parts well, but you're never allowed to talk about more than the parts you know like the um the person in the university context the cl- or the class of people who are supposed to talk about the whole right i would say are university presidents because they are presiding over the whole of the university and they should be able to speak to um what the nature of the whole is what sort of progress the whole is making is the what is the health of the progress of the whole and uh and um you know we 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 don't you know we certainly do not pick university presidents who think critically about these these questions at all well i remember um discussing uh with a a president of a very highly regarded university uh he came to me and said can you explain how your friend Peter Thiel thinks? Because I just had a conversation with him and I could not convince him that the universities were doing uh, fantastically in this university in particular. Like, how does he come to this conclusion? And I said, well, look, P- Peter uh, doesn't come uh, you know, with a PhD, but let me speak to you in your own language. I started going department by department talking about the problems of stagnation. It was very clear that there was no previous experience with any kind of informed person making such an argument. I mean, this was a zero day exploit. But it's it's all, yeah, but it's, but, you know, in in some sense, if you're a president of a university, you know, you, you should, um, you probably don't want to talk to people that dangerous. You want to avoid them and you don't want to have such disruptive thoughts because you have to, you know, convince the government or alumni or whoever to keep donating money that everything's, you know, everything's wonderful and and great, and uh, and um, no, I think one has to go back quite a long time to um, to even identify any university presidents in the United States who said things that were distinctive or interesting or or powerful. Well, you know, there was you know there was Larry Summers at Harvard, you know, a decade and a half ago, and tried to do like the most minuscule critiques imaginable, and got you know crucified. But uh, you know, I don't think of you know I don't think of Summers as a particularly revolutionary thinker. Well, he he was possessed of an idea that the intellectual elite, in which he undoubtedly mm-hmm. saw himself a, a part of, had the right mm-hmm. to transgress boundaries. Mm-hmm. And I think what's stunning about this is the extent to which this breed of outspoken. Mm-hmm. Um, disruptive intellectual has no place left inside of the system from which to speak. But it's, you know, but there's, it's, it's not that surprising. Like in a, in a, in a healthy system, you can have wild dissent and it's not threatening because everyone knows the system is healthy. True. In an unhealthy system, um, the dissent becomes much more dangerous. Okay. So, uh, so, you know, this is, and I, I think that's, it, it's, 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 it's not that surprising. You know, the, there's always a, you know, one, one riff I have on this is always, you know, if you, if you think of a left-wing person as someone who's critical of the structures of our society, right. um, there's a sense in which we have almost no left-wing professors left. I mean, That's know, the, right. In, in the well, like, in, in, Noam Chomsky <laughs> still, is still there as sort of a last remnant of some clade yes. that or no longer exists. Le- left-wing in the sense of, let's say, just being critical of the institutions they're a part of. Right. And there may be some that are you know, much older, so if you're maybe in your 80s, we can, you know, we can pretend to ignore you, or you know, it's just what happens to people in their eighties. Sure. And um, but uh, but I don't I don't see you know younger professors in their let's say forties who are um, deeply critical of the of the university structure. I think it's just um, it's just not you know you can't have that. It's like again, if you come back to something as as um, as reductionist as the uh, ever escalating student debt, right? You know, the bigger the debt gets you can sort of think, what is the $1.6 trillion, what does it pay for? And in, in a sense, it pays for $1.6 trillion worth of lies about how great the system is. And so the more the debt goes, the crazier the system gets, but also the more you have to tell the lies. And these, these things sort of go together. No, it's, it's not a stable sequence. At some point, right. this breaks. Um, you know, again, I would, I would bet on you know, a decade, not a century. <laughs>